let me introduce Carol Fink, who is going to be speaking about the unexpected arrivals, Soviet Jews immigration to West Germany from 73 through 89. Um, by way of introduction, Carol is humanities distinguished professor of history emerita at the Ohio State University, where she taught between 1991 and 2011. She's the author and editor of 15 books, most recently, West Germany and Israel, Foreign Relations, Domestic Politics and the Cold War, 1965 to 1974. Um, writing 20th century international history, explorations and examples, and Cold War and International History, soon to be published in its third edition. Two of her earlier books, The Genoa Conference, European Diplomacy, 1921-22, and Defending the Rights of Others, the Great Powers, the Jews, and International Minority Protection, 1878 to 1938, were awarded the George Lewis Beer Prize of the American Historical Association. Her biography of French Jewish history, a life in history, has been translated into six languages. Since retiring in 2011, same year I retired, Carol, uh, Dr. Frank has continued to lecture nationally and internationally and has been a guest professor in China, Israel, Germany, and Australia. She is currently at work on a global history of the 1980s. Um, let's give her a Meredith's Academy welcome. And Carol, it's all yours. Thank you. Good afternoon. When we planned this lecture more than a year ago, I greatly hoped to be with you in person in Columbus. Nevertheless, I am pleased to have this opportunity to speak to the OSU Emeritus Academy and its guests. Let me start by expressing my thanks to Joseph Dunnemeyer, who originally invited me to give this talk, to R.D. Nelson, the current chair of the Academy's steering committee, who has made all the arrangements, and to Jason Homan for his technical support. And finally, to all of you for sparing an hour on this beautiful spring day to join this program. My talk today centers on the project that I began two years ago with startup support from the Emeritus Academy and which eventually took me to a dozen archives in Israel, Germany, and New York City. Although my work has been suspended by the pandemic, I still hope to resume it before too long. My topic is unexpected arrivals. The sudden appearance of Soviet Jews in the land of the murderers in the 1970s. How they got there and the German response. This is a subject that combines three of my long-term interests as a historian, the Cold War, migration, and German and Jewish history. And today I shall share some of the preliminary results. I think my PowerPoint has disappeared though. What has happened? Um, okay. <laughs> Let me begin with this startling article that, pre that was published on November 11th, 1974 in the West German news magazine, Der Spiegel, announcing that 500 Soviet Jews, among them these children, were being housed in West Berlin's Marienfelder refugee camp. This revelation plus the evidence that I have found of a steady migration of several thousand Soviet Jews to West Germany between the 1970s and 1980s, refutes the information in every historical account. Look at this. Jewish emigration from the former Soviet Union to Israel, the United States, and Germany. And look where Germany falls. It's all zero until 1993. Simply not true. Three historical issues underline this presentation. The first is the Cold War and the human rights struggle centering on the exodus of the Soviet Jews. 
Second, the Soviet Jews themselves and their tortuous path to Germany. And three, the host city and the host country's response. Now, so we'll start with Jewish emigration from the Soviet Union. As you can see from these numbers, despite all Israel did since its founding, the numbers of Jews leaving the Soviet Union until 1966 were very small indeed. Although Soviet law and Soviet ideology had placed no obstacles against emigration, Stalin and Khrushchev made it very, very difficult for anyone to leave. Everything changes in 1966 for a lot of reasons. One was that the Soviet Union was looking for detente with the West and Premier Alexei Kosygin announced on the anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1966, that the country would place no obstacles against people seeking reunion with their families abroad. Second, 1967 June and the spectacular Israeli victory in the Middle East kindled very strong sentiments among Soviet Jews living in the borderlands, but also a very strong anti-Semitic and anti-Zionist backlash by the Kremlin. And third, by the late 1960s, things had changed for Soviet Jews. Until then, they'd been a almost assimilated population with good jobs and good homes, but suddenly they were becoming increasingly marginalized. They and their children found a glass ceiling against jobs, against school opportunities, and even a growing anti-Semitism. Now this awakening of Soviet Jews coincided with the beginning of the human rights movement in the USSR, led by people like Sakharov and Solzhenitsyn. But the Jews had a movement to leave, not to reform the Soviet Union. They simply wanted to leave. This is an interesting map. This is the borderlands of the Soviet Union, where most, where, where the borders had changed after World War II and where most of this awakening took place. And in this photograph, we see a phenomenon called the refuseniks. The Soviet Jews who were turned down in their application to leave. They invoked the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the UN Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which their government had signed, and which stated unequivocally that people should be free to leave their country. They organized protests and civil disobedience and hunger strikes and press conferences, and they petitioned the Soviet government and the UN. And by 1969, this movement to help Soviet Jews leave had become an international movement led by the United States and with Israel as a strong partner. Using the biblical language, let my people go. This was not only an attempt to rescue a seemingly endangered community and take them to Israel. It was also an international Cold War crusade against the Soviet Union, enlisting governments and labor unions and church leaders and extending the demand for family reunion to unlimited emigration. And in 1971, there was a major conference in Brussels bringing together 750 Jewish leaders from 40 countries giving publicity to this demand. Now the Kremlin denounced this interference in its domestic affairs, but it vacillated over its response. The Politburo was evenly divided between those who wanted to get rid of the troublemakers and those who considered the diplomatic risks of expanding the numbers, anticipating the protests, for example, of the Arab allies, and also the political consequences of losing an educated, professional population, and not incidentally encouraging other people to ask to emigrate. So the Soviet Union muddled along, increasing the number of exit permits between 1972 and 1973, but also raising the number of refusals. The Kremlin also unleashed a propaganda campaign 
stressing the Jews were very happy in the Soviet Union, they were unhappy in Israel, and that many had demanded to return to their homeland. Now, under Nixon, where detente had begun, Soviet Jewish emigration had entered Cold War politics. Soon after the May 1972 summit, the Kremlin suddenly instituted a diploma tax, forcing Jewish emigrants to repay the cost of their higher education. Thereupon, Senator Henry Jackson and Congressman jo Charles Vanek, riding the wave of outrage in the US, threatened to remove the Soviet Union. This had been one of the key things about detente, that the Soviet Union was going to attain most favored nation status unless it allowed completely free immigration. And this became a major political issue in the United States. Now, Henry Kissinger, who was very much against Jackson Bannock and, and this pressure on the Soviet Union, attempted to squash Congress's threat and to rescue detente and tried to convince Andrei Gromyko, Soviet foreign minister, simply to set an annual figure, any figure, 40,000 Jews leaving every year. In December 1973, Congress overwhelmingly passed the jackson Bannock Amendment. And the Kremlin was not cowed. It was not cowed because in October 1973, after the war in the Middle East, oil and gas prices spiked. The Kremlin not, no longer needed the United States as much as it had. It could make trade deals with Europeans and with Japanese and with other countries that did not worry about the exodus of Soviet Jews. And so the Soviet Union decided, and here are the figures, and you can see how they go up and down and up and down, depending on world conditions, that it alone would decide who could go and when they could go and how. But there was another wrinkle. This is a nice document. It's the exit permit. Shown here is the 1979 permit of the 25-year-old Elena Kassel, which was obtained after an arduous vetting procedure. This is the translation. That included assembling a massive amount of documentation and waits, sometimes for up to three years. Refusals could be based on anything, the protection of state secrets, the applicant's apparent failure to get the family's permission. But in most cases, the government would give no reason at all. Once in possession of the permit, Soviet Jews had to renounce their citizenship and carry only a limited amount of personal property on their journey. Moreover, after 1967, after the Soviet Union had broken diplomatic relations with Israel, there were no direct flights between Moscow and Tel Aviv. Therefore, there was another arduous chore. To reach the Israeli administered transit camp, one had either, this was outside Vienna, in Chernow, one had either to fly to Vienna, or if you didn't have enough money, you had to take a two and a half, sometimes three day trip by train to Austria, where you would be vetted by the Jewish agency and then head on to Israel. Part two, the Soviet Jews. Until 1973, almost all the Jews who left the Soviet Union went to Israel. There, they were lodged in the absorption centers where they received intensive Hebrew language instruction and employment guidance before moving into their subsidized housing and setting out on their own in Israeli society. Although they immediately received an identity card, it took three years to get a passport. But starting in 1973, some 900 Soviet Jews began to leave Israel and the numbers rose to 2,500 in 1974. And there were various reasons for this. Poor job prospects, inadequate housing, language prospects, compulsory military service for males and females, discrimination over mixed marriages, the heat, difficulty in adjusting to Israeli mores and culture, and the tense political atmosphere 
after the October 1973 war. Disgruntled Israeli officials and the public labeled them Yordin, those who had descended rather than the Aliyah of coming to Israel. Israel, after all, had made it possible for them to leave the Soviet Union, providing the money, the documents, and had amended its nationality law to allow non-Jewish spouses and children to come in. And not unexpectedly, the mechanics of departing Israel were arduous. Um, they had to assume the costs of travel and acquire the visas, and aid organizations weren't very helpful. Suddenly, in September 1973, on the eve of the Middle East War, everything changed. There was a terrorist attack on a train carrying Soviet Jews. Actually, there were five, not three, who were taken. And as, as, as this train was crossing the border into Austria, it was seized by Palestinians. And Austrian Chancellor Bruno Kreisky, who had long been upset about the existence of the Chernow camp, because twice it had been the target of terrorist threats, closed the camp. Eve, this is Golda Meir pleading, even Nixon pleaded to keep the camp up open. Instead, from that point on, Soviet Jews, when they arrived in Vienna, went to a Red Cross camp. And there they could simply decide whether to proceed on to Israel or to go somewhere else. And many of them, these were called the dropouts, simply decided they were going elsewhere. Most of them decided to go to the United States, which made the Israelis, if you can imagine, rather furious. But the US and the aid organizations insisted on another human right, the right to choose, freedom of choice. And Jewish organizations pressured the Nixon government to open the gates, and it did. But some Soviet Jews made an unexpected choice instead of heading to the US, they decided to go to Germany. In a lengthy interview with a former highest official, I learned that US aid workers kept very close track on their numbers and movements, and they offered no aid at all, and they took a very negative view of the Soviet Jews choosing the land of the murderers. Why did they go to West Berlin? The majority of those who came had spent a good part of their life hearing Soviet propaganda against the Germans, that it was a fascist regime filled with former Nazis and that NATO threatened the communist world. However, in 1970, this is, this is an occult photograph of West German Chancellor Willy Brandt who had initiated his Ostpolitik, his Eastern policy, had changed the whole image of Germany. Here he is kneeling before the monument at the Warsaw Ghetto. Brandt changed the view of Germany, not only in his own country, but in the whole Eastern world. Moreover, Ostpolitik had made it possible for family and business and other ties to be restored. And many of the people who had opted to go to West Germany had ties there. Why Berlin? <laughs> Lying deep inside East Germany, encircled by a 96-mile wall and accessible only by three prescribed air routes and a narrow rail and highway corridor, it was nonetheless an attractive location. Despite its falling population since the wall was built, it was West Germany's largest city with almost 2 million inhabitants. It was rebuilt after World War II as a modern capitalist city. It had no military draft. It was shielded by the Western powers. It was a prominent cultural and intellectual center. It was relatively inexpensive and it had Marienfelder, a very modern transit center with excellent facilities where the Soviet Jews could be begin their stay. But even more important, West Berlin was the home to West Germany's largest Jewish community, 
with some 5,000 people. It was led by the 62-year-old Heinz Galinsky, a survivor of Auschwitz-Buchenwald and Bergen-Belsen, a man who had lost his wife and his parents during the war, but had decided to return and to stay in West Berlin. He was an advocate, an organizer, a writer, a fundraiser. He was an oracle in the German and Jewish press, warning the German public against forgetting the horrors of Auschwitz. And he convinced the Berlin Senate to give the Jewish community parity with the city's Protestants and Catholics. There were also dangers in Berlin. Initially, these had come from the neo-Nazis who had vandalized communal buildings and cemeteries. By the late 1960s, left-wing militants had also come on the scene. And the presence of thousands of Palestinian refugees, plus the establishment of a PLO office in East Berlin, increased the sense of danger. In addition, the Soviet Jews faced another major obstacle. Like Israel, West Germany defined its citizenship purely in ethnocultural terms. Citizenship included all Germans, including those who had been expelled from Eastern Europe after World War II. But like Israel, West Germany had no formal immigration procedure for non-Germans and an unusually long 10 year period for naturalization. Thus millions of guest workers, Turks especially, had absolutely no chance of becoming German citizens. However, there was an extraordinary loophole. Under West Germany's 1953 law, the Bundesvertriebenengesetz, BVFG, those who came to the country from the former East that had once been part of the German Reich, that had been part of German communities in Eastern Europe, could apply for an expelli card and immediately receive German citizenship and preference for housing, jobs, social services, including unemployment insurance. And notably, the qualifications for this document were unusually subjective, someone who identified him or herself as a German, and Jews were not excluded. And so almost all the Soviet Jews who arrived in West Berlin intended to apply for this expelling card, claiming their knowledge of German language, education, uh, their, their participation in German clubs and workplaces, their love of Beethoven and Mozart, and their knowledge of German folklore. Interestingly enough, Galinsky was perfectly prepared to support them. But those unable to prove this German identity were in trouble. Those coming from Israel could not claim to be refugees. That is, they had not fled because of war or persecution. And those arriving from directly from Vienna without a passport because they'd given up their Soviet papers could simply be expelled. So now to our third section, the response. We should recall that in 1974, when the Soviet Jews appeared, it was a year of major shocks. There had been the spike of oil prices after the October war that had led to carless Sundays and unemployment. There was also Willy Brandt's dramatic resignation in June of that year due to the discovery of an East German spy in his office. And the Soviet Jewish arrivals presented practical and security problems. Marienfelden was quickly filled up. The newcomers were scattered all around the city. And remembering Chernow, there was fear of terrorism. Now, before 1974, West Berlin officials had made extraordinarily generous decisions on the expelli card. The mayor of West Berlin, Klaus Schutz, was reluctant to get tougher with them. But he called on the federal government for guidance. And this is where it gets interesting. Foreign Minister Hans Dietrich Genscher favored a generous handling of the Soviet use. He was unconcerned about either Soviet or Arab reactions 
He was opposed to expulsions on both diplomatic and humanitarian grounds. And it's interesting in view of what happened to Germany in 2015, Genscher also admitted that if they made too many exceptions, more people would come. But not to worry, not that many would come and it would be all right. The Israelis didn't take too sad a view on this. The US did not uh, object and the Soviet Union was quiet. And all of this was, was sealed in a meeting between Galinsky and, and Genscher. So in December of 1974, there was a stopgap measure. All the Soviet Jews in West Berlin could stay. But because the community's resources were overstretched, Galinsky pleaded that other states begin to pitch in. Now the public reaction was modest. In the Bundestag, there were no objections. The West German press thought it was all right, although it's a good idea not to let too many illegal people come in. Israel quietly concurred, although the press grumbled over the deserters. And the US press was okay with the decision. But over the next year, things became tougher. Although the Kremlin reduced the number of exit permits, Jews continued to leave Israel. They continued to drop out in Vienna and they continued to come to Germany. And this was a Germany now facing rising inflation, rising unemployment and major terrorist incidents in 1975. To the mayor's immense frustration, however, the interior minister, this is Werner Meinhofer, refused to tighten up, refused to force the states to get busy and help West Berlin out. This kind of, again, foreshadows the quandary today. Germany's a federal government and every state has the right to do as it will. The diplomatic repercussions, however, remained manageable. In 1975, uh, there were two major visits by Israelis. This is Yitzhak Rabin and earlier far Foreign Minister Rabin uh, alone came. Neither of them objected to this rising number of Soviet Jews arriving in Israel. Rabin did, however, show up in West Berlin. There he is with Klaus Schutz, and he addressed the Soviet Jewish refugees. By the summer of 1975, there was another housing crisis and a rising number of refusals. But the West Berlin Senate was stuck. And once more, another stopgap arrangement, letting the people stay, giving them permanent resident status and work permits and allowing them to, to, um, to, to assume a new life in West Berlin. And from that time onward, Berlin became what they said in the German press was a hot tip. The numbers continued to arise, rose to about 6,500 by 1980. And the Jewish community continued to help them, continued to receive a subvention, but everything changed in 1980. Uh, you can see how the Soviet numbers go up and down during this period. The, the pinnacle was 1979. It drops in 1980, and then it begins to fall off. But not only did the Soviet, Jew, the Soviet government crack down, this, this has to do with the sanctions against the war in Afghanistan and a kind of retaliation. But also, a sensational part of my story, there was the discovery of an international counterfeiting ring that had been selling false documents to the Soviet Jews in Israel, cleansing their time in the country uh, rewriting their antecedents. And when the local West Berlin authorities re-examined a whole lot of the expelli applications dating back to 1976, they had made scores of arrests, although they didn't throw anybody out. They just threw some people in jail. Now, I haven't gotten very far with this. There were even a couple of murders, but I will continue with this at some point. After September 1980, the West Berlin government cracked down and only those Jews arriving from Israel with a passport and a visa would be allowed to apply 
for residents. Um, yeah, this is the beginning of, of the discovery of the false papers. Um, and you can see the numbers falling off in the 1980s as well. Nonetheless, on the eve of German unification in 1990, the West Berlin Jewish community stood at almost 7,000. It had gone from under 5,000, it, it had risen by 2,000. The largest in the Federal Republic and the total number in the country had written to 30,000. The majority of those I have interviewed had settled in, found jobs, become West German citizens. The, the time had been reduced from 10 to eight years and it found a new homeland in what some still call the land of the murderers. Now for some concluding thoughts. First, the exodus of the Soviet Jews represented an, ex an important expansion of human rights discourse during the Cold War. It expanded from family reunion to an unrestricted right to leave, something incidentally, despite numerous international agreements that not all countries permit. Emerging inside the Soviet Union in the late 1960s, with the Soviet Jews protests, publicity, nonviolent actions, and appeal to national and international law, by 1969, this had become a major Cold War issue, testing whether Moscow would cede the right to control its population for the benefits of detente. And it turned out that Moscow would not. Now, whether driven by internal or diplomatic considerations or a combination of both, it's curious that the Kremlin, despite signing and even publishing the Helsinki Accords, fiercely resisted any form of outside pressure. It decided who could leave, when they could leave, and under what conditions they could depart. And it's this erratic decision-making, these numbers bouncing up and down, that kept Soviet Jews, their proponents, and their potential hosts, including the Germans, off balance. Now, the Soviet Jews, too, who arrived in West Berlin were technically not refugees. They had not been driven out. They had chosen to leave a difficult, even menacing homeland. Those who had gone first to Israel could certainly not claim they were fleeing from an oppressive regime. And all who showed up at Marienfeld had insisted on their freedom of choice to select their destination, something that's pretty unheard of. Three factors influenced their arrival in West Berlin. The unique political, historical, economic, and demographic character of that city. West Germany's unique admissions provisions involving ethnic Germans and to the country's Nazi past. They arrived in a city known for its generosity and for be and, and being Jewish placed them in a special category for exceptional consideration by the authorities, even when, as we have seen, they tested West German law. Yet despite their small numbers and their minimal affiliation with Judaism, these Soviet Jews contributed to the revival of Jewish life in West Berlin and West Germany before 1990. They created a third wave of Russian culture in the center of Europe. They replenished communities depleted by assimilation, death, and emigration. They stirred a humanitarian reaction by the local government. They mobilized the Jewish leadership and population on their behalf. To be sure, the behavior of some criminal elements also stirred a backlash. Finally, for West Berlin and West Germany, this unexpected and until now largely unknown arrival of the Soviet Jews occurred at an extremely difficult time. There were diminishing gains from Ostpolitik. There were only faint prospects for Middle East peace. There was an economic slowdown and there was terrorism. The Soviet Jews raised security and diplomatic complications. They divided local and national authorities. And they also produced sensationalist press reportage and very contested court decisions. But based on my preliminary report, on my preliminary work, 
there is absolutely no question that the federal and the West Berlin governments gave very special treatment to the Soviet Jews, especially compared with their much harsher treatment of the Turkish guest workers and the thousands of refugees from Chile, Vietnam, and the Middle East. But whether these erratic and generally permissive decisions in the 1970s and 80s were driven by atonement for the past, by the small numbers, by a shift in the German debate between an ethnic and a liberal state, was simply by practical concerns. Will, I hope, when the archives reopen and overseas travel will again be possible, this will require further investigation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carol. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed the information in hearing it. Uh, Carol has asked that if you have questions, you type them into the chat. So um, I will tap dance for a moment and give you an opportunity to write something, write your questions in the chat. And I will, let's see, remind you again that um, small grant submissions are coming up do May 1st. Oh, I just watched Carl just turn up. It's so much fun to sit here and, and be watching everybody's screen on screen and see what they're doing. Um, small grants will be due May 1st and by April 30th. If you have anything else for the newsletter to please send it to Joe Donnemeyer. Um, I'm not seeing any questions yet. I can't believe that. No questions. Helen's got one. Um, excuse me. I can't. I don't know how to text this. I don't know I how to use the chat. chat. Can oh. I just ask a sure. simple yeah. question, Carol? Sure, sure. Um, I was in Berlin a lot in the seventies, and I, I remember this. And I, I guess you said you interviewed these quite a few of these people. Mm -hmm. What, uh, one thing you didn't mention is, um, well, I'm assuming these were uh, mostly secular Jews? Not all. Uh, not all, no. But, not, all, not all. Okay. <laughs> but, um, and Berlin, of course, uh, what interests me is to what extent did they go back? To what extent were they originally from Germany, which had a large... Uh, to what extent had they escaped to the Soviet Union in the 30s from Germany? And uh, did they? No. And they did not. No, no, they were Soviet Jews. Uh, the largest number, oh, Helen, I were see. folks, uh, it's so interesting. Most of them came from Riga. Okay. And so they, they, they would say Riga on the spray. <laughs> uh, yeah. if, if you, but um, I, I mean, I've done some fairly meticulous study on this. Some came from Odessa. It was mostly the borderlands. Oh, uh, lands uh -huh. that had been permeated in the past with German culture. Riga, to some extent Vilnius, also up, up. Now, the Chernovitz people tended to go to Vienna and stay there. Um, that makes sense. Yes, but, but Odessa was another place. Now, by 75, you're getting a very different emigration. And there's some suspicion that the Kremlin was letting people out from the heartland. So this would be from Moscow and Petersburg and Kiev. Now they had no desire to go to Israel. They were secular. Um, and Berlin was a great tip. And I've interviewed some of these people, you know, people who until the late sixties, early seventies had a pretty good life in the Soviet Union. You know, Papa had been a general in the Red Army thing. And then suddenly that glass ceiling appeared right, right. right after the 67 war. And, and um, so you, you get a new immigration uh, beginning in the later 1970s. You know, the big bulge is between 75 and 79. They're either leaving Israel in large numbers 
and heading for the US or Canada or Australia, but some of them want to be in, Ger in Germany, they want to be in Europe. They want to be in Europe. In Europe. And, and, and that, that odor, you know, because remember uh, the folks in the heartland um, had not seen the Nazi atrocities, but the people in the borderlands sure, they did. had experienced it, um, yeah. uh, especially in places like Riga. Um, but but um, yeah, they, they wanted to be, those who stayed wanted to be in Europe, wanted to enjoy a European culture. Um, it is true that they all still speak Russian. <laughs> Sure. And, 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 and they created, a couple of people I interviewed said, well, it was like the 20s, you know, the people who fled the Bolsheviks or the people who came at, you know, they, they, they created a little Russia in Berlin. In Germany, uh, that was very big in the beginning of the 20s, yeah. And it was easier to do that. Later on, many of these Soviet Jews went to places like Frankfurt, some went to Cologne, some went to Munich, but it was much easier for all kinds of reasons yeah. to do this in Berlin. I mean, this was a very well subsidized community. So just briefly, th these were not people who had left no. a Berlin. No, 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 no they, they had never been German. And then they had to... never been German. They, they, oh, that's very uh, interesting. Now, they, they were born, um, the older ones were born in the independent Baltic states, Latvia, Lithuania, uh, uh, Estonia. But uh, when they came, they were Soviet citizens, yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. It was fascinating. Thank you so much, Carol. Welcome. Uh, looks like Morris has a question. Hi. Um, in the early 70s, uh, this is just an anecdotal comment. Uh, I went, uh, I visited Moscow. And uh, while there, I decided I should go to the synagogue mm -hmm. on, on a Saturday morning just to see what was happening. Well, nothing was happening in the synagogue, it was closed, but people were gathered outside. And I got into a chat with um, several young men. And uh, to my uh, pleasure, uh, they invited me to, to have a glass of wine with them and so on, even though it was the morning. And uh, I obviously asked them about what it was like to be Jewish in uh, the Soviet Union. And they said it was not bad, that the, the Jews tended to be more educated, they tended to be in professions, they visited. And then one fellow, the one who spoke the most said, the one thing is we cannot leave. And that was, uh, real, that really struck me. He said, you know, it wasn't, life wasn't bad, except for that psychological pressure that they were not permitted to leave. Now your figures don't entirely support that, um, but I, it was just a, a comment that, about how they felt. I just wanted to mention that. I don't know whether that suits your own experience, Carol. Oh, do you want to respond? They could leave. It was just very difficult. It was, mm -hmm. and particularly for people who were in uh, the scientific professions, you know, the government could make up any reason to say no or give no reason at all. You know, it wasn't like you could just take the first, you know, plane out of Moscow. Um, mm -hmm. I also know uh, one of my closest friends is a Soviet Jew who didn't leave. And uh, I think there was a question out there about whether there are still Jews in the Soviet, in Russia. Yes, there are. There's, there's a large Jewish community and, and a reborn Jewish community. And, but remember the Soviet Union is no more. There's also a fairly significant Jewish community in Ukraine, uh, in Moldova, um, and where else? Uh, most of the other, Belarus, Belarus still has a Jewish community as well. Yeah, I mean, we don't know the numbers. There's something called the European Jewish Congress and Russian Jews are very, very active in that. There, there's been a, a tremendous reawakening of Jewish mm -hmm. in Russia since 1990. And you probably know this, but Putin is a great friend of the Jewish community. 
uh, for all kinds of reasons. And th there's, there's a real, not only traffic and trade, but in people between Israel and Russia, very close contacts on both sides. They come and they go, they do business. I have academic friends who are in and out of the Soviet archives all the time. Yes. Now, the situation in Germany, if I can just take my story two steps forward, um, after German unification and because of laws changing in this country, um, there was a flood of Soviet Jews, former Soviet Jews into Germany. And now it is the largest community in Europe, except for Russia. Um, and, and this is a very different kind of emigration. Um, and it has changed Jewish life in Germany considerably. Mm -hmm. Uh, they, they, they've completely overwhelmed the existing community. Um, I know some of these people. Um, it's, it, it's all changed remarkably since 1990. And it's, it's one of the big discussions in Germany to this day. Um, uh, one anecdote I have to tell you, though, is that the German consul in Odessa asked the Israeli consul, well, how can you tell who is a Jew? <laughs> Um, and in the end, they give up and they just let people in is what they're doing. Hi, this is Rolf Barth. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, sure. Okay, I have several questions. And the first uh, is how has the um, large influx of Muslim refugees impacted on the Jewish community in Berlin and in other parts of Germany? Ah, that big question and it's important. Um, how is it impacted? It's, it's, it's been very complicated. It's, it's been very, very complicated for German Jews. On the one hand, they were very much in favor of the 2015 policy of miracle to let refugees in. After all, what Jew could be against that? On the other hand, there has been a rise of hate crimes against Jews in Germany, but not only from the Muslims, from, from the German right wing. The German right wing is responsible for most of the terrorism in Germany now, not the Muslims. Uh, the, the, the verdict on, on the Syrians and the other Muslims is how dramatically and powerfully they have integrated and contributed to the country. It's been almost uneventful that those million migrants, the kids are in school, the parents have jobs, they're learning the language. Um, yeah, so I, I think for the Jews of Germany, the threat is more on the right. The threat is much more on the right that, that, than, than from the Muslims. But unfortunately, um, part of Islam is not particularly favorable to, to Judaism. And one wonders how this might in the future result in conflict between the Jewish community and what now is a very sizable Muslim community in Germany. Well, you know, Germany's had a Muslim population. They have Turks. And the Turks were finally able to become citizens in the 1990s. Germany really amended its whole immigration procedure after unification. And it's very complicated in Germany because the education system is devoted to telling children about the past. They go to Auschwitz. They learn about the Holocaust. But now they have this immense foreign population, Turks, Palestinians, Syrians, people from Afghanistan, learning about German crimes, to which they have some difficulty relating. They've got their own pasts mm -hmm. and their own bad memories. And this is a very, very big problem for the Germans, to teach Auschwitz to these people and basically to say to them, and basically to say to them, if you will be German, if you will live in this country, you need to accept and acknowledge the past of this country and not feel separate for it, from it. Um, whether they're succeeding in this, I'm not sure. You know, any more than the French are succeeding in making their former colonials believe that Joan of Arc is, you know, what, what, what was their saint and their savior. This is one of the very difficult cultural and societal and civic problems in all of Europe right now. You know, that that national story, and for Germany, it's this very powerful story. I mean, why did they let these Soviet Jews in? They were legal, most of them. 
because Germany had a special responsibility toward Jews, which nowadays a good number of the population, even Germans now, cannot entirely accept this, this, this sense of overcoming the burden of the Nazi past. Now, someone of Merkel's generation, you know, the current chancellor still, um, does, but, but you, you, you have a larger population, including the right wing, you know, that, that, that has a very, very different version. Something not all that different from what we're going through here, actually, where the national story is, has gotten splintered. How well have the Jews from the former USSR assimilated into German life and culture? No, they're Russians. They're, <laughs> they're Russians. mostly Russians. They're mostly Russians. They watch. For, I mean, again, the, the people that I met and talked to, um, and and I think this is this is now true. You know, this is this identity politics everywhere. They watch Russian television. I met someone who spends day and night scheming against Putin. You know, you, you know that Navalny went to Germany. Why did he go to Germany? Because there's a tremendous support system for Russian dissidents in Germany. You know, I mean, it's 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 like that. Um, um, do they become German? There isn't that pressure to assimilate in that way. The, the the German idea is really more of a civic consciousness, not a national. Except except the World Cup. You know, when Germany wins the World Cup, you know, they they, they get all riled up. But but the country really does tolerate quite a bit of diversity. And, and the arrival of a million Syrians, and, well, people from the Middle East, you know, has, has, has moved that quite a bit, quite a bit. Um, they, don't, they don't do melting pot in Germany. They, they, they don't even ascribe to that. But, but you said that the immigrants or, or the refugees coming from Syria and other Muslim countries were making great steps to assimilate into German life. No, they're getting jobs, their kids are in school, they're learning the languages, they're doing- they're not assimilating. The, no, integrating is different. Not they're integrating. They're integrating, they're paying taxes, their kids go to the school, they're building cars and trucks and high tech things, but they live among themselves, they speak Arabic, they're opening up all these wonderful falafel shops and bakeries and everything else, yeah. There isn't the pressure, even in, even in rural areas. They, 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 there isn't the pressure on these people. What, to put on later hosen and start yodeling? No. No, they, 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 they live in their culture. Well, it's really quite different than in America, where basically someone can come from far off in different countries from all over the world. And within a generation, they consider themselves basically American. Europe is very different. Europe is very different in that way. Actually, Canada is different too, by the way. Canada does not have, you know, Canada is a very multicultural country and, and never puts this pressure. Mm. On. You know, you go to Quebec or, or even neighborhoods in Toronto, you know, and, and one could say, you know, I'm in a foreign country. You're not, you're in Canada. Um, Carol, and, yes, Carol, I have a question from the chat. Yes, from Peter, um, would you comment a little more on how Willie Brandt's os Ospolitik. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Yes. Would help to change the perception of Germany, Germany among Soviet Jews. Oh, absolutely. I mean. Uh, this is an extraordinary story. He left Nazi Germany in 1933 as a refugee and actually came back in the uniform of a Norwegian army. Uh, he became the mayor of West Berlin at the time of, that the wall went up. You know, Brunt was a young, vibrant politician, the sort of John Kennedy of the 1960s. Um, he was determined when he became chancellor to make peace with the East even at the extent of recognizing the post-World War II borders, that is saying our border with Poland is fixed, East Germany exists. Before 1969, uh, they never even recognized East Germany. They used to call it 
the Soviet occupation zone, you know, Brandt turned everything around. He wanted a kind of coexistence, in some ways more radical than what Nixon, you know, was trying with detente. And Brandt put a new face on, on Germany to the people in the East. Trade began, people could start visiting, uh, suddenly that ugly German, and remember the Soviets and all the communist governments had thrived on fascist propaganda against the West and particularly against West Germany, which was after all a country that didn't really purge a lot of Nazis right away. But with Brandt and with this new generation coming in, it suddenly became a, a much more attractive and desirable, and let's face it, a much more prosperous country than the Soviet Union or the Soviet satellites. So he put a face on this. I remember he visited us here at Ohio State University. And I asked him a question. And the question was, when did he think that the two Germanys would be united? And his response was a very simple one. There are people who love Germany so much <laughs> that they would like to love two Germanys rather than one. <laughs> and that was his answer. Well, but he was there when the wall fell down. He, 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 he stayed alive until the day the wall fell down. And he said, that which has been torn asunder will now come together. But nobody, look, let's face it, folks, you all are of a certain age. Nobody expected the wall to fall down. This was a complete accident. This was something that was absolutely unexpected. Um, and, and, um, and all things happened as a result of it. But in the 70s and 80s, people con continued to believe that the Cold War would drag on, that the Soviet Union would maintain over its people and over Eastern Europe, you know, maybe a little milder than usual. Nobody realized that the invasion of Afghanistan was going to cripple the Soviet Union, or that the price of oil would drop, and, 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 and that would really hurt the Soviet economy very, very deeply. Nobody realized these things. Nobody realized, nobody anticipated solidarity, you know, in the Polish workers, you know, who, who formed the biggest labor union in the communist world. You know, all of this came. All of this came unexpectedly. And um, it's kind of wonderful that Brunt was there to see it. Do we have any other questions? If somebody doesn't wave at me soon, I'm <laughs> going to say good day to everyone. And Carol, again, thank you very much for our wonderful presentation enjoyed by everyone. Thank you all. Thank you.